Psalm chapter 42 verse 1 to 2 As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Deep within every person's heart, there is a longing for the divine. Some may try to ignore it, but we all carry a knowing inside us. It's like an inner voice that stirs when we hear the good news. Why does our inner voice stir when we hear about God's grand creation? Because deep down, we sense the truth. When we hear that God crafted the heavens and the earth, our inner knowing confirms it when we are told that everything didn't just happen randomly. But there is a purpose behind the universe's complexity. Our inner voice echoes the truth. It resonates when we learn that God personally shaped us, creating us in his own image. We are not just random creatures. Our inner knowing attests to that. And when we realize that the vast, intricate universe isn't just chaos, but has a divine plan, our inner voice affirms it. As folks listen to the truth of their moral compass, that inner sense of right and wrong isn't just something society cooked up, but a guiding gift from a higher power. Their hearts confirm it. When they understand that the love, hope, and faith that they hold run deeper than mere feelings, their inner knowing nods in agreement. When other people discover that their deepest desires for purpose and meaning find their answers in a personal connection with a loving God, their hearts resonate with that truth. Each sunrise, each breath, and each and every precious moment they cherish, they realize our precious gifts from a God who knows them inside and out, and their hearts are moved. The same goes for understanding that the creator of this vast universe expects his creation to love him and follow the laws he set. It's not just a notion, their hearts confirm it's true. But why do folks wrestle with their conscience when they hear this truth? It's quite simple. The gospel message shines a light on our guilt. Who likes to hear that they're at fault? That's why some folks push back against the gospel message because it points the finger at each of us, reminding us that we've all fallen short of God's infinite standards. He set rules that we haven't quite lived up to in deep town. We know it's true. It's true that God asks us to love one another because we're all created in his image, making us special in his eyes. When people hear that God wants us to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind, and that our love is shown in actions, like it says in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Some resist. People struggle with their conscience because they are aware that they haven't always followed his commandments. They know they've broken his rules and are guilty of offending an eternal, boundless God. They're guilty. They try to push this truth away because, honestly, who wants to believe that an everlasting God might be upset with them? Who wants to imagine that every action thought indeed will one day face scrutiny and the consequence is eternal all because they upset an everlasting god who really wants to face the idea of spending eternity in the lake of fire who wants to think about all their mistakes being forever on record who wants to reckon with the fact that the secrets they whispered in the dark will one day see the light and who wants to imagine that the choices they made in their youth might haunt them for all eternity when people's inner knowing nudges them towards the existence of God, they know it's true. But have you ever wondered why some folks turn away from this calling? It's quite straightforward. They're attached to their wrongdoing. Just as John chapter 3 verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light is coming into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. They prefer the darkness because their deeds are sinful. People walk away because they're fond of their actions. They prefer darkness over light. They cherish their sins. Many deep down understand that the gospel message is true and that God expects holiness from them. But their love for their sins keeps them from turning away and repenting. So, to deal with it, they often find it easier to walk away from their faith. Christ's sacrifice is God's way of saving humanity from destruction. However, if someone faces ruin, it's often because they're drawn to the shadows, not the light. Loving darkness comes easy to many. Dark deeds seem enticing, and all that darkness brings is wickedness. 
The evil we see in the world today is a testament to this truth. People have an affection for darkness over light. Human nature tends to favor the obscurity over illumination. They find comfort in darkness because it hides their secret wrongs, sinful pleasures, and misdeeds. They'd rather keep their wickedness hidden. All the goodness in this world traces back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Him, the world would be overwhelmed by darkness, evil, and sin. Anything good in this world is a result of His presence. The Gospel calls out individuals on their wrongdoing, but many prefer not to face their sins. The Gospel exposes the darkness within human hearts, yet people hold on to their darkness because they cling to their wicked ways. Jesus Christ embodies the light. As the world appears to decline, it's primarily because humanity is increasingly turning away from the light. The church must grasp the times it exists in. Christians live in an era of darkness, and it's vital for them to awaken to this reality. I've shared all of this to lead to this point. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 For the message of the cross sounds foolish to those who are on a destructive path. But for us, who are finding salvation, it's God's mighty power resides. Within the scriptures, there are some verses that often go unnoticed, and this one is a prime example. It holds mysteries with eternal importance. This teaching will help us remember the incredible power of God that set loose for our rescue and help us to be grateful for the grace that allowed us to join the ranks of the saved. Our salvation is God's most precious gift to humanity. Sadly, not everyone embraces it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 shows that there are two groups, those headed for destruction and those saved. The Bible repeatedly emphasizes these two groups and even on Judgment Day, these distinctions will remain. As Romans chapter 1 verse 16 puts it, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it holds God's power to save everyone who believes, starting with the Jewish people and extending to the rest. Just like Paul, we should never feel embarrassed about the gospel, knowing it holds the power to save even the most devoted sinner. The gospel's might can humble them, making them surrender to Christ's Lordship. Those of us who have experienced salvation must rise to the challenge of sharing the message of Christ with the lost, leading them back to God. The truth is, we've been saved to save others, and we mustn't neglect this mission. The message of the cross may seem like foolishness to those who are heading down a destructive path because the devil seeks to obstruct their path to salvation. But when the veil shrouding their minds is lifted, they can become powerful instruments in God's hands. Some sinners, if they turn to Christ, have the potential to wreak havoc on the kingdom of darkness. Just consider the case of Apostle Paul. See how mightily God used him to advance the cause of Christ. Think about what the world would have missed if Apostle Paul had never been converted. We mustn't lose hope in sinners. They could turn into formidable pillars of the kingdom once they find salvation. The Great Commission that Jesus entrusted to us before his departure from this world should be taken seriously, especially when we see signs of the end times unfolding. Remember that God is in charge, as Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 to 6 reassures us. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Regardless of your current circumstances, God is in control. He knows you personally, understands your pain, and is aware of your deepest desires. His love for you is everlasting and unique. He cares about you in ways that go beyond human comprehension. He hears your cries, sees everything you're going through, and has not forgotten about you. Now I want you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine hearing the voice of the Lord speaking directly to you, saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Close your eyes and let the comforting words of the Lord reassure you that you are His. You are His child, and you belong to Him. There is no love like the love that God has for you. I sometimes feel compassion for those who haven't yet found faith in God and endure a life without His presence. When an unbeliever faces the moment of their passing, I imagine they must be overwhelmed by fear. 
fear of the unknown, fear of what comes after death, fear of the flames of hell. But that's not the experience of a child of God. A child of God faces death without fear, because they know where they're headed, and they know with whom they'll spend eternity. Revelations chapter 21 verses 1 to 4 paints a beautiful picture. And I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things are passed away, for all of eternity, God will be your God, that's something to eagerly anticipate, God will be your God, and that's a future worth looking forward to, God will be your God, and that's what awaits you beyond the realm of this life.